Now we get to kick off with uh, what's happening with the export market and the global market in general. Now that we're starting to see some softness, especially out of Asia, it's in, important to appreciate what does that mean? How is that going to impact you know the next couple of months, especially as we start to see some of the deliveries that were purchased in November, early December start to show up on the coast, uh, you know, and start to go into that, those movements. So just to start with the U.S., uh, we, we did get a big uh, step up in distillate. You know, we were thinking the increase was going to be a bit smaller, but we, we were expecting a bit of an increase. Um, gasoline, pretty much steady as she goes, uh, up 133,000 barrels a day. You know, propane, again, is going to continue. That LPG side is going to remain robust. We're going to see that 133,000 barrels a day went through. We're, we're right at about 1.48 million. Uh, that'll probably stay around that 1.5, especially with the um, spare capacity. The interesting thing that we're going to have to talk about as we see pressure in the dis, in the jet fuel market, and remember, kerosene can go into uh, two different pools depending on you know the levels, and for the most part, they can uh, go straight into the distillate pool. So this is going to be something to watch. Where as jet fuel becomes a bigger problem on that demand side, are we going to start to see additional increases in the middle distillate? Even though we've had some uh, some normalization in the U.S. as jet goes into DISTI, and instead of seeing you know some of the drawdowns that we were expecting, or at least some of those those um, the steady moves lower, instead we just kind of go flat, and that that's a very big possibility because typically that jet obviously it's not a huge number, but there's there's normally some demand out there, and as that demand also dwindles, that's going to continue to. Uh, to, to be a bigger problem as headlines come across now that France uh, passed the threshold to 3 million COVID cases as an acceleration, the spread of the virus prompted warnings from the government that a third uh, lockdown was possible. Again, this is this is why we, we continue to see some of these issues in general and the liquids um, builds in the U.S. can continue to be uh, fairly large. Again, we take out propane when we talk about that as you see some of these increases just because propane is coming from a different, uh, a different source set. Again, like where if in some of the other areas, it's coming a lot from oil. Obviously, we have a lot of what gas. We have a lot of uh, uh, capacity coming out of some of these different locations uh, in general. So when we look at U.S. exports, uh, crude exports, you see we had a big drop of 760,000 barrels. That uh, it's going to be timing. You know, we, we've been saying that 2.6, 2.8 is going to be that comfortable number as we have this essentially this this base of about 1.9 million going into the market right now based on what's out there. And then you have some of those spot cargos. Uh, the issue here is when we look at spreads. So spreads have started to open up a little bit, which has been good. But again, the spreads opening up is going to be uh, problematic or is going to be good for getting exports out. But the tightness that we had in spreads is going to cause some of this strife in general, especially when we have uh, issues in, uh, in, in Asia for demand and what demand looks like going forward. So that's going to be a, a big issue when we think of the, U the U.S. has been sending about, let's call it about 900, 900 to 980,000 barrels a day into Asia. And if that starts to go down, how much of that can be displaced as Europe goes into either extended lockdowns or further lockdowns? That's going to, you know, where does the U.S. crude go or as we hold the line at 11 million barrels a day, are we going to see a, additional crude going into storage because we just don't have a home in the refiner or the export market? And as we go and look at you know those gasoline exports, our view was that it was going to it was going to hang above the the that that nine years or you know yeah nine year uh, average or so. We thought it was going to it was going to hold above that level, but really kind of follow through. Here you had a little bit of a, a bounce, but again, holding above that five-year average, uh, nine-year average, which is where we think we're going to maintain, especially when we look at Latin America and where some of the movements are. The, the pressure and the reason why we're not going to get this big spike is just there is a lot of cargo still coming out of Europe, still over uh, pr providing some sort of overhang when we consider kind of where this is going in general. And that's there's enough demand to keep us above the average. But again, the, the, de the demand is heating up in the international market. China is now pushing more uh, gasoline into the market, and that's going to accelerate through January. We saw a small dip in uh, India demand. We know South Korea, Japan is slowed in general. 
So as some of this Asian cargoes come come across, Middle East is going to get displaced. You know, we talked about how Saudi Arabia was starting to increase or start up one of their refiners. That's going to put more product into the market. Middle East then goes into Europe. Europe then goes into the and then Europe it doesn't have the demand. They've already started slowing down their purchases from the Middle East as they tried to balance. So again, that's going to put some pressure on, on our uh, exports. You know, this is one when we look at uh, distillate, we, we thought we were going to come back or just below that, that, nine, that nine year average. We came and essentially kissed it. Uh, there's not much to say one way or the other. We think that this will fall back down, but it's not going to fall back below the cloud. We think it's just going to hang uh, essentially just below this, um, uh, the nine year average and follow the trajectory. So the trajectory is going to be a little flattish. Uh, could see a, a you know a small move down just because again that timing delay, but this is going to be something to watch because I think distillate as we start to see jet you know losing demand, how much of that goes into the the uh, pool, and then you know how much of that demand that is there in jet or kerosene gets start utilized as as distillate and is going to put more pressure on our exports as we see uh, exports still coming out of Europe. Europe buying less from the Middle East which means that the Middle East in general is going to have to find a new home and that's going to start to compete with some of our uh, natural markets in Latin America. Now, when we look at uh, U.S. crude exports, you can see that we had a big drop still above the five-year average as we should be just given we have more assets to uh, to put stuff into the uh, market. This is going to this is gonna bounce, but it, again, it's not going to go back into all-time uh, seasonally all adjusted all-time highs. It's just going to be more of a, a gradual move up, you know, back to that 2.6, 2.8 million barrels a day. Uh, LPG, again, the demand is robust. Uh, that's not changing. We're going to continue to see this flow into the market. Uh, Mont Bellevue pricing continues to be supportive. Uh, even though it's elevated, it still uh, supports it moving into the market. Uh, this is why we're going to continue to to stay well above the top of that range, and uh, and it, there's there's some timing in it. So this will drop. It's not like it's going to be just a perpetual move and then just go sideways. There will be some ebbs and flows, but it's definitely going to be at the top of the range going forward, which is going to be a net positive in general. Uh, but when we look at at what's happening in the world today, so you can see from January into Feb, so. Uh, there's some some issues in Libya. Libya has cut uh, a couple hundred thousand. I think it's about two hundred thousand barrels has been taken down on a production level. As they're working on some pipelines, you know they're looking to find investment to help rebuild and repair large parts of their um, uh, pipeline uh, system. Again. Even though they're pr reducing production, they have been able to to put some additional crude into storage. So even though production is down, they can still maintain exports uh, around that 1.1, 1 .1, you know, 1.2 within you know within that range for the most part. Russia is going to continue to shift higher. Uh, Norway again is at that 1.7, uh, you know, that 10-year high when we look back in time. Nigeria has been having some problems, and um, they they had some force majeures. But we're also seeing some kick out from January into February, which is why we're getting that, that pretty sizable uh, st snap up from one point, let's call it 1.46 to that 1.7 as we're getting some of those, those cargoes getting shifted over. Uh, Angola is, has been a pretty steady decline. Uh, and it's just because, again, China is, is, the, is where Angola settles a lot of their crude. Uh, you know, a sixty, a little bit above sixty percent. So Angola has yet to sell three to five cargoes of February loading. So they've yet to sell three to five of Feb, and Feb is is essentially the lowest number that they've had in the since two thousand eight. So they they're exporting less. Their loading schedule is some of the lowest ever, but yet they still can't place crude. So uh, three to five cargoes of February loading out of 30, uh, 33 planned export shipments for the month. Pace of sales remains very slow, uh, slower than, and, and so January was slow, and this is slower than January, which is, you know, again, you know, the inherent problem, but it drops from an unsold of seven to 10. So they, they, did, they did see some, but remember they cut prices in the first week of Jan. That helped move some through. But not only is Angola having an issue, about 15 to 20 Nigerian cargoes of the 51 scheduled for Feb, loadings have yet to find a buyer. Sales remain very slow. So again, 
this is a problem. This is going to put more crude because we did see a drawdown on uh, on some floating storage in West Africa. This is going to put more back on the water as they can't as they're struggling to place some of these crudes, which is why when we think about West Africa, Goldilocks type crude, you're talking about medium sweet going back to segment one. When we talk about that API, you know, some of this crude is is, is sweet, which means that it's low in sulfur and has between, you know, let, let's let's call it 28 to, you know, 35 API. So again, this, this kind of sweet uh, medium is, is really that where it can run through any refiner and make a very uh, a very strong uh, suite of products. So again, that's going to be something to watch because West Africa is always the first to, uh, to put up their loading schedule, as you can see here. And as we've been talking about for months and months and months, and anybody that's heard me talk about the energy markets years and years and years, and it, they're the first, and it, because of the quality, it always trades at a premium. So the question is what premium and what kind of discounts do they have to give to OSPs <clears throat> and in the spot market to incentivize some of those movements? And this is part of the issue that we're seeing overall. So when we when we look at India, so far through the first half of Jan, uh, diesel demand, diesel sales are down 6.6% month over month, which is 3.5% year over year. Gasoline has taken a little bit of a step back of month over month change of 6.1%, still up year over year of 8.5%. LPG continues to be robust of that, you know, even though it's down a little bit month over month, still that 5% above year over year. Jet fuel again is it, that's going to be that the name of the game in terms of you know that forty eight percent drop N- unlikely to see that change especially as India and a lot of these other countries have locked down a lot of their international trade to mitigate some of these new strains that are are popping up in Brazil and South Africa and the UK in in, in you know really increasing that domestic spread. You know, but when we think about diesel, that is where we're going to gauge how is the economy doing? How are things recovering? You know, where is the growth? And that's why when we think about India, we, we keep talking about there's there's positives. You know, there, there are things that have gotten better, but they're still not back to normal. You know, gasoline is still showing that there's still some concern on the consumer sentiment. You know, sales have increased a bit, but uh, on the retail side, but not enough to offset and to get that GDP to where it should be. But Diesel is going to be the one to watch. Now we we talked about last week how uh, how how Chinese imports of oil were at you know twenty eight month lows. You know there was about nine million barrels a day, but even though we had a decline in oil imports, we had an increase in refined product exports. Speaking to some of those slowdowns that we've been talking about, that has pushed essentially trying to manage their storage. That has pushed more exports into the market. They, you know, some guys still had some export quotas available, so they were going to make sure to fill those. So that also incentivized um, the movements. But when we look at Singapore, this th- we're going to see uh, additional moves of uh, gasoline going into uh, into storage, especially when we look at some of the gasoline cargoes coming out of the out of uh, Asia and the Middle East that were initially indica- uh, indicating. Parts of LATAM, parts of uh, Europe are now actually being redirected and are going to be uh, are targeting Singapore at this point. And you know, when we think about you know, which is where crack spreads are, you know, they, things have started to soften, especially on a global level. Again, putting some of that weight or some those some of those issues uh, on on a global level. And when we look at diesel exports, they've continued to uh, to fall, uh, which is which is a positive in terms of where things sit. So gasoline is more of that consumer demand, and if you I highly recommend it was one of my favorite segments that we've done is the segment five of the econ show. We really try to drive home how the consumer is really struggling and gasoline is going to be the most consumer oriented. And there is where we continue to see these cracks within the system. Diesel exports came down as we did have an increase in uh, manufacturing and uh, some of the infrastructure building. But when we look at credit impulses, when we look at some of these high frequency data points, we think that the GDP in general is going to start to slow a bit. Economic activity in China is going to slow a bit as you know, obviously Lunar New Year seasonal uh, seasonal adjustments are are there. But just given the spread of COVID, you know, some of the um, uh, wanting to slow down some of this debt and uh, and this credit going into the market and pulling some liquidity out, that's going to just slow general activity within China, which is going to put more of these cargoes on the water in general. 
Now, when we think about you know Saudi, what has Saudi done? You know, we obviously they they've cut a million barrels a day for Feb and uh, and March. And when we think about exports versus stocks, you have to consider, well, they're pulling, they're still pulling out of storage. And, and this is when we really try to hone in on production versus exports, where production has been slow, but we've seen this pretty steady grind up in exports as they try to normalize some of their production, you know, what's sitting in tanks, trying to right size their position. And now what, what's going to happen as, you know, I, I, uh, Iran is, is talking about how they're going to increase their, um, uh, their crude production back to pre-sanction levels, which is technically 2 million barrels a day. You know, can they really get there? You know, it, given it's going to take time to do that, you know, they've, they've said it's going to take two months, probably take a little bit longer, but there's a quick mill that can easily happen at this point. But, how are they going to sell it? They still have sanctions. And this is really kind of this first challenge for Biden's administration of how are they going to win to address uh, Iran. And that's something that we're going to do talk about in more detail of when we have a little bit more information from from the Biden administration. But we have, I think, enough to talk about what uh, Iran's looking to do and how they're looking to get active, especially as crew as Saudi cuts production there. Or Ron's looking about how can we take some market share. Uh, uh, Iraq cut um, Bosphorus shipments into India. India needs heavy crude. Iran has always been a great uh, a great team player with uh, with India. Does that start to come back in? And because we need India support, do we let or turn a blind eye to some of these additional exports into India? Likely, especially because if you think about what how we we now labeled <clears throat> uh, the the Chinese. As uh, with genocide for the Uyghuri, um, you know, let's just say systematic uh, uh, destruction in in, uh, in Xinjiang, those are going to be some issues that are going to continue to crop up, and that's going to provide opportunity for uh, Iran to push more barrels to India, and again for Saudi to kind of balance some of their um, their crude and storage as it's been elevated, obviously since 2016, trying to get some of this down, right size in general. This is going to be something to watch because they're going to be able to maintain more exports. And I think the market is appreciating. So now when we look at oil and transit, it's started to come <clears throat> come down as uh, as some crude is, uh, has shown up on the coasts and is now sitting just offshore. You know, this is something that's going to kind of ebb and flow based on the new um, crudes coming across. This is going to start to tick back up. And it's just, again, it's going to hold kind of that five-year average. And that's when we look at crude on the water. Uh, crude on the water started to come uh, come down back to the five year average, based on where things are moving. You know, China obviously with some of their slowdowns, Asia slowdowns. This crude on the water is going to remain elevated. It's not going to come back up to the top of the cloud, but it's just going to remain above that five year average as we go through uh, the remainder of Jan and into February. And crude and floating storage again. Pared down back, it's now you know, essentially touching the top of the cloud. This is something that we think is going to have a little bit of a bounce. And it's just because we're seeing the crew that has left uh, the North Sea, uh, Europe in general, heading into, uh, into, into China is going to show up. Again, it's going to sit offshore. There's going to be some of these timing delays. And we do think you, uh, West Africa is going to see a little bit of an increase of that floating storage. Uh, Genscape, uh, you, when we look at European oil in tanks, you can see that it's still at a seasonally adjusted uh, five-year high. Came down a little bit, but just given the issues that we're seeing on PMI, economic data, you know, high-frequency data, mobility, there's not much drawdown that we're going to expect at this point in time. And But when we look at time spreads, again, when we think about Saudi trying to sell out of storage, time spreads on the front months, when we look at March, April, Yet we're at about 13 cents. Again, this is into backwardation where, you, you know, contango is at the, at the negative side. So you're going to put stuff into storage and here backwardation, you're going to pull it out. So when you, you think about uh, Saudi cutting production, does this, is this their way of trying to get some of this through, capture some of, this, uh, some of the market? Again, this is going to be something to watch for some of those near-term moves. And we do see dated Brent remaining soft. Uh, we're still seeing physical pricing remaining soft with some inability of West African crudes moving. This remains a net positive in terms of some of the things that have happened, especially when we shift over and we look at euros because euros uh, have started to trade at a bit of a premium as China, India have looked to make up some of the, uh, some of the expected lost cargoes coming from Saudi. 
But when we look at crack spreads, so yeah, Singapore in general has all shifted down. You had a little bit of a spike going into the, into the end of December. And as we've been saying, pressure is mounting on, uh, on refiners, especially with crude having their, that, uh, that spike coming from the Singapore, um, the, uh, the news of uh, Saudi cutting those blends. Uh, and then by doing that, again, shifting up the front, the front months, making it more expensive for, for refiners to buy. And because, as we've been talking about, you know, demand remains weak on the back end, it's hard to push through price increases. And that's, again, uh, causing problems across the board. Now, uh, this is just pulling one out and just highlighting. You can see that when we look at Singapore, Dubai, hydro cracking refinery margins, we're talking something at 51 cents. Again, bottom of the cloud of five-year average. We're, we're talking about something that is, is really going to go negative, especially with the lack of demand in, in Asia driven by China. Some of those exports increasing, you're going to see that pushback on not only uh, margins, but also uh, barrels in storage. Now, this is what we've been talking about with euros. Euros had that nice price increase, but even with that price increase and that the lack of ability for the refiner to push through some of that demand, this is where we're seeing those margins come back under pressure. We now have uh, the one, two, three, four uh, of these of these grades, the euros in terms of, let's just put, pull it out, uh, topping, uh, hydro skimming, when we look at hydro skimming HVU, and then when we look at topping in general, you know, we're seeing some pretty decently negative margins. And a lot of the others of hydro cracking, thermal cracking, FCCs, all of this is just shifting down and will be negative as uh, just given where demand sits right now where the lockdowns are in the Mediterranean. Again, the, the numbers just don't jive, which is why we think that there's going to be uh, some of these euros and, and, and especially ESPO is going to go into China, but now China's slowing down. So you're going to see some of these stranded barrels that are going to start to compete. So we'll start to see some softness in the physical market, which will help refinery um, margin. But in the meantime, this is something that's going to trend down hurt refiners. They won't want to operate as much. Coming back to segment one, when we talk about how much downtime exists in the refining uh, market, that's not going away anytime soon. Now we will look at Fujara. Uh, Fujara had a net build. Uh, its total stocks rose 27,000 barrels or 0.1%. And it's it was, it was kind of bifurcated as to where that increase was. Uh, stocks of light distillate saw a draw of 471,000 barrels sitting at about 6.9 million this is the first time they've stood at under 7 million since December. The East Suez gasoline market was seeing bearish news in Asia weighing on fundamentals. That's not, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I thought I was going to sneeze. That's not going away anytime soon. It's actually going to stay fairly, um, uh, fairly weak, which will start to put some of the additional uh, capacity into the market in general and into storage, which is going to push it into a uh, Fujara. Uh, when we look at stock and middle distillates, they fell 521,000 barrels to about 3.9 million. Uh, this is the first time that we've been below 4 million since mid-October. The gas oil market remains stable with fundamentals, uh, you know, kind of holding the same. Unfortunately, we think that's going to start to weaken. And again, we, we this is going to put more into storage in general. Uh, the the biggest increase came on the heavy disty resid side, and it's really because everything that was taken advantage of last week when we when we talked about that flat pricing on uh, on bunker fuel, guys took advantage of that, and then the moment that went away, this just got refilled. So again, this is just going to be a bit that was a bit more of an arbitrage play. Arbitrage is gone. Builds start to come back. And we think at this point, we're going to start to see some of these steady builds into Lunar New Year and then accelerate as, as we go through the Lunar New Year period. Looking at floating storage just as an aggregate, we can see storage fell 17%. It's, kind of, it's back down to where it was on, from, on December uh, 18th or so, uh, sitting at about 80 million barrels a day. That's the lowest since, uh, since that period. Uh, Asia Pacific, as we talked about, is down about 7.5%, but still elevated. Uh, Europe is down 18%. West Africa down 46%, which will go back up. Middle East is the one that had a big drawdown of about 65%. Again, coming back to those Basra cuts as they as they were trying to clear some of the glut that they had on the back end. North Sea is down. That's going to reverse. And the U.S. coast is down as we had more moving into storage, just given some operations in uh, picking up on uh, pad three. 
Super tanker crude imports remain uh, at five-year highs going into China. They've dipped to about 105 right now, uh, coming off of 110. Again, there's it, it, this is going to be fairly elevated just given what they've purchased, and now it's going to start to show up. It's flagging there. China's unlikely to sell any of this into the market because when we look at demand, they imported 9 million, but they still ran about, uh, you know, let's call it 11 you know, actually a little more, about 12 million barrels a day. So they were pulling from storage, making room for this crude coming in. So again, this is something where these are going to remain elevated going uh, going across. Asia floating storage is what we're talking about, remaining very elevated. India remaining fairly flat in terms of activity. China slowing down, Japan slowing down, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, South Korea slowing. Again, these are this is why we think this number is going to start to it's not going to explode to the upside. We think that there's enough to kind of keep us within this this range, especially as more boats start to show up on the coast. North Sea, again, move back to the five-year average, you know, based on the loading schedule that we discussed earlier. This is going to st- make that, it's going to follow this trend. Uh, it, it, there's probably enough demand just based on floating versus spot cargoes and what's moved out of floating storage into the market that we're going to hang beneath that five-year average, but still uh, still trend in that direction. West Africa is the one that uh, had a big spike down, but uh, you know, still above the five-year average. We think that this is going to have a spike up, you know, especially given the difficulties Angola and Nigeria have of selling Feb. And we already had some bleed over from January into Feb, and now we're seeing Feb, uh, February de- um, loadings difficult to sell, which is going to push into uh, into March. Again, this kind of reverberating issue. Uh, Middle East, uh, separating this out, just just so you can see it, we're we're back within this noise where we kind of where we normally are, looking at 2020, uh, 2019, 2018. So there's really not much change, and we're kind of right within that comfortable average of those uh, years. Europe again is going to follow the average. You know, we'll we'll probably see some of these cargoes kick back out just because obviously uh, they have their own issues with COVID. But when we look at the storage levels of product, even with exports, gasoline builds are are continuing. Gas oil builds are continuing. Fuel oil builds are continuing. Jet fuel is small draw. Naphtha is small draw. Again, these builds are continuing to mount as activity is accelerating to the downside on the industrial level, on the production level. It's already weak on the consumer level, looking at retail sales, looking at what's happened on people driving, going to work. It's the it, the only thing that was really propping it up was that manufacturing was the, uh, the other side of it. And that's starting to really go away at this point, which is a problem. And this is just breaking out because when we look at, when we look at the, uh, the, the gasoline, we're, we're right near those uh, all-time highs and we're trending up when, and just based on the pressure that we're seeing in the market, that's not going down anytime soon. When we look at gas oil, it's, it's above that, you know, let's call it 24-year average, but it's, it's still trending in the wrong direction. And based on the new data that came out for, the, for December, January, and what that projects going forward, those leading indicators, these bills are going to continue to rise and or exports are going to rise. We've already seen imports get dropped. Imports dropping should help support or keep, you know, storage stable, but it's still going to drift higher. And again, showing just the weakness in the market. Uh, Singapore seasonally adjusted all-time highs. We had a build of about 1.6 million in total. Uh, this is, this is again, just trending in the wrong direction. Uh, what we should be trying to draw down. China's increasing exports by increasing exports or at least keeping exports elevated given where the demand is as they see more slowdowns, more lockdowns, more restrictions. That's going to put more exports into the market, reduce uh, crude. That's going to put more product and that's going to maintain that elevated level. Uh, when we look at middle distillate, we're pushing uh, near all-time highs uh, in Singapore. Yeah, that's, again, speaking back to Fujara, Fujara and that middle distillate and how we can remain oversupplied across the supply chain on a global level. This is going to keep, um, again, some of those refiners just inactive until we can clear some of this glut. But the glut's going to be tough given economic indicators remain are, are weakening. And again, this is where we continue to see some of those issues. Uh, light distillate, you know, uh, seasonally adjusted all-time high. Uh, this is something that we think is just going to be pretty stable uh, with increases 
it's going to remain uh, at the top of the cloud setting new seasonally adjusted highs but again it's just going to we don't see this big surge but it's it is going to remain elevated we do have more cargos that have been redirected into storage which is, again is going to be problematic when we look at um uh so teapots they've actually finally started to slow uh they're down about two percentage points uh, refined, uh, re- refined, state-owned refiners have ticked up a little bit. They're up on average about one percent. So again, we've lost two from the teapots, picked up one by the state-owned. You know, net net, we're going to continue to see this walk back, and it normally happens on a seasonal level. Obviously, Lunar New Year is uh, is, is that big period, but not only the Lunar New Year, we also have the issue in terms of uh, COVID spreads, new lockdowns, you know, some of these slowdowns that we've been talking about on the economic side, which is just going to keep some of this um, reduced by reducing this, more crude goes into storage, more crude gets stuck offshore. And again, that remains the bigger problem. This is when we when we look at teapots, teapot uh, storage remains elevated on, on a crude level as well as a fuel oil stock level. So again, there's there's a lot out there, a lot of competing data points. It's always going to be a matter of which one is the driver, which is in uh, is the narrative. You know, we continue to see an oversupplied supply chain, not just on the oil side, but also the refined product side, which is just, you know, we need to see those refined products really draw down to see a meaningful move lower in the oil stocks. Because, you know, right now OPEC is trying to manage uh, manage that those levels, manage the supply, but we're just not seeing that demand reaction. And with new COVID cases increasing in different parts of the world, you know, some of the seasonality uh, kicking in, we think that there's going to be a, a bigger uh, increase in refined products throughout the world. Again, limiting some of that oil demand. So thanks again for watching. I know uh, we had a lot about a lot of talk, a uh, lot to talk about today, given that it was so late. So we had data points that are typically delayed that we could uh, include here. So if you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, thanks again for watching. Uh, we hope you have a great weekend. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network.